So the main topic for this video is green economy. So I'm going to discuss the definitions, where green economy is coming from, what terms are available that are actually similar to green economy. So we'll look at green growth, circular economy, and then what methods and tools are available to assess performance. So to see whether we're moving towards a greener economy overall. Starting with definitions, we have many, but the first one that has, made, has been made public uh, is by the United Nations Environment Programme, now UN Environment, and they stated back in 2011 with the Green Economy Report that the green economy is one that results in increased human well-being and social equity while reducing environmental risks and ecological scarcities. So this definition already highlights that the green economy is an economy and it is supposed to grow or at least that there is no major concern with the fact that we should look into degrowth as opposed to economic growth. But what matters and what is more innovative about this definition is that this economy has to work within the limits of what is provided in terms of carrying capacity by nature. So the environmental dimension is more important in this definition than what you have seen in the context of sustainable development or in general national development planning. And social equity also takes a center stage. In fact, after the Rio Plus 20 meeting that happened in 2012, we started talking a lot more about inclusive green economy to highlight not only the role of the environmental dimension, but also the social dimension. The concept of green economy has to be customized at the local level. Uh, this is because it is in nature systemic, so it captures social, economic and environmental dimensions of development. And as a result, we are confronted with local contexts at the national level that are always unique meaning that there are always some unique features of social or economic or environmental dimensions at the local level. Uh, for instance, culture plays a very strong role in every national development plan, as well as the availability of natural resources plays a very strong role to the extent to which renewable energy can be used or water efficiency should be improved. So overall, we see three main areas of interventions in a green economy, but actions have to be customized all the time. So these three main areas of action are reduction of emissions, then we have resource efficiency, and then we have prevention of the loss of biodiversity. By reducing emissions, we reduce air pollution and the impacts of climate change. We also make the economy more resource efficient in terms of energy, for instance. With resource efficiency as a second step, we expand the list of interventions to all sorts of natural resource use again, to make the economy more resilient to oscillations, for instance, to market dynamics, but also to ecological scarcities. And then with the third point, if we prevent the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services, we reduce the cost of running the economy through that infrastructure or capital that we need to put in place to replace the services that nature offer that are slowly being lost. So basically, we're talking about three interventions that make so that running the economy becomes cheaper or less costly, and it's done in a more effective way, and so as a result, it is more resilient. We have several additional definitions of the green economy that have been promoted over the last few years. Uh, one that is very much connected to this green economy definition is the one of green growth. So green growth is defined as economic process or progress that fosters environmentally sustainable, low carbon and social inclusive development. So in this case, we see that there is progress, again, economic growth being mentioned explicitly, and it forces sustainable, low carbon and social inclusive development. So we see again, in this case, both the social aspect and the environmental aspect. And this is, again, a definition of the United Nations of the program for uh, Southeast Asia. We also have the OECD, which has always been a very strong proponent of green growth. And they say that green growth means fostering economic growth and development while ensuring that natural assets continue to provide the resources and environmental services on which our well-being relies. So again, in this case, we're talking about growth because it's, it's explicit in the name that is being used, but also it says that it, this growth has to happen while ensuring that there is a continuation of the services that we receive from natural resources. So in other ways, we can say that, or in other words, we can say that uh, we are not going to have this economic growth at the expense of future potential growth. So we are not going to compromise the potential for future growth by utilizing resources, especially natural resources today. Another relevant definition is the one of a circular economy. In this case, we define it as an economy that reduces the consumption of resources and the generation of waste. 
Now, this is a bit more of an extreme um, compared to green economy and green growth because it leads to an economy that possibly has a, a closed cycle in terms of natural resource use. So everything that is produced and is utilized in the economy can be recycled and reinjected into the economy. And of course, this makes so that we have more sustainable consumption and production because we reduce those processes, such as the extraction of natural resources, that are harmful to the environment and limit the resilience and sustainability of economic growth. Now, these definitions are all very relevant and in some cases are used interchangeably, but it is important to understand where they're coming from and why they are being used. Now, if we think about the organizations that propose them, we see that the United Nations, especially the Environment Programme, normally works with developing countries and focuses on maintaining natural capital or making better use of natural resources to make sure that the environment is not compromised. So it is natural that they would focus more on framing it as green economy rather than green growth and being more inclusive in terms of social development as well as in terms of um, allowing future generations to thrive. At the same time, the OECD and other parts of the world like Southeast Asia are emphasizing more the need for growth uh, because in developed countries, like OECD countries, um, growth rates are generally lower than we see in developing countries. And the economy is normally more geared towards secondary sectors, so industry and services, the tertiary sector. While in most developing countries there is high reliance on natural resources and so the primary sector is dominant. So the goal for OECD countries is to ensure that this 2 or 3 percent, maybe 4 percent of GDP growth every year is maintained and that is very important. That's what drives the economy. That's what allows government budgets to be allocated because we have an aging population, because we have debt related issues. So that growth is crucial and that's why it features in the name of green growth. At the same time, it is very important to note that the most advances that these countries can make is in improving resource efficiency to reduce the cost of production. And in most cases, these countries have lost biodiversity to a large extent. So that's why green growth focuses really on resource efficiency to make so that production can continue, but it will continue in a more effective way and maximizing value. Another definition that is worth mentioning is the one of green jobs. This is probably the most complicated to analyze because green jobs are defined by the international labor organizations as all those jobs that are maintained or created in the transition process towards a green economy that are either provided by low carbon intensive industries or by industries whose primary output function is to green in the economy. So basically, this definition is very general and it says that any job that is created to contribute to any of the goals of a green economy can be considered a green job. Meaning any job that is in the renewable energy sector to reduce emissions or any job that supports water efficiency, so resource efficiency, or supports maintaining biodiversity can be considered a green job. Now, a lot, of, a lot of discussions have been happening on this topic because the, the definition in general is fine. And you would say that any job that contributes to the green economy can be considered a green job. But how do we measure them? So this is where problems uh, begin to arise uh, because a worker in the production chain of a wind turbine has a job that could be exactly the same as a worker that works on the process of producing a vehicle, a car. Uh, with a combustion engine rather than an electric car, or even more so a worker working with Tesla has exactly the same job than a worker with a company that produces more traditional engines. So it is at the point of measuring green jobs that issues arise and where it is very important to understand whether it is a job that contributes to a final goal or whether it is a process that needs to be measured to define whether a, a job is effectively green. As of today, there is no agreement as to what is the best approach to use. So different governments would use different approaches, but also at international level, there is no one set standard to measure green jobs. Continuing on the topic of measurement, um, also when it comes to measuring green economy and green growth, there are no absolute measures of defining whether an economy is green or is actually greening in general. Um, this is because, as we said before, the green economy concept has to be customized at the local level because countries have different natural resources and different contexts in which the economy can be considered greener or can be moved to a greener stage. So it is impossible to say whether you need 50, 60, maybe 70% of renewable energy to be considered green 
in some countries, more investments will be needed to go from 2 to 5% than what you will need in other countries to go from 70 to 80% of renewable energy. So again, there is no fixed set of indicators or targets to identify whether or define whether an economy is in fact green, but there are many different indicator frameworks and reports and indices, such as for instance the Global Green Economy Index, the GGI, that determines whether the country is moving in the right direction or not. And in this specific case for the GGI, there is an interesting approach that merges statistics for past performance as well as surveys uh, that are conducted all over the world uh, with participants from very diverse countries to see whether there is an expectation that things will change, for instance, due to new policies being implemented for which data are not available yet, or whether there is an actual recognition of the work that the government is doing to turn the economy greener. So again, this is an area that is evolving and it is also being affected by the Sustainable Development Goals and the many indicators that are now available to measure the targets. But there is no fixed single approach that answers all questions related to the green economy. So it leaves room to customization at the country level, which is again very good. This was a problem with the Millennium Development Goals. And so it calls for governments and companies to be responsible and make an effort to come up with indicators that speak to their context and help the policymaking process. So to conclude this first part of the video, uh, why is green economy being talked about so much? Or why the United Nations Environment Programme used it as a, as a very strong line of work uh, since 2008, when they started developing the Green Economy Report that was ultimately published in 2011? and then was followed by many other organizations, including GGGI, the Global Green Growth Institute, being founded and working in this field. Well, it is basically because we have seen several concurrent crises emerging over the last 10, 15 years. And this is a bit of a new paradigm. Um, we have been used in working to solve one crisis at a time, whether it was economical, whether it was because of agricultural production or a water scarcity crisis, but at this stage, um, we have been confronted with several of these crises simultaneously. So a financial crisis in 2008, climate change looming and being formally adopted by several governments around 2005, 2006. And then we've seen the agricultural crisis with food prices uh, going through the roof, as well as oil prices reaching over $150 per barrel by 2008. And so all these crises are not independent of one another. They're actually interconnected. And it's that recognition that made so that a more systemic approach packaged in a green economy or green growth type of approach emerged. Now, the term is not new. Um, since the early 1980s, we had talks and conversations about forms or some forms of a green economy or a blue economy, which is more related to oceans and how we use these other natural resources, with the green economy being a more global concept that includes all natural resources. And that was the result of the oil crisis and the fact that sustainability became a major concern back then. Now we see that with the emergence of these other crises that we've experienced since 2005-2006, uh, there was a, a resurgence of that discussion. And so momentum had to be gained, especially in light of the upcoming Rio Plus 20 conference, to make so that these issues would be at the top of the agenda of decision makers again. So this is one way of explaining why green economy and green growth have emerged so strongly since 2008-2009 in the global discussion about sustainable development. Uh, but of course a lot can be said about how green economy and green growth have distracted the attention of stakeholders away from sustainable development, uh, which is what the Millennium Development Goals focused on and what the Sustainable Development Goals now um, aim at driving, so this change for sustainability. So the next item that we should discuss is what are the similarities and differences between green economy and green growth and sustainable development. So at first, um, green economy was seen as an objective, like sustainable development is. And that created some confusion and some concern in the field or with decision makers that all of a sudden had to change their approach, having worked for years with system approaches for sustainable development, now they had to switch to something new called green economy. But in practice, what happened is that the green economy, instead of being a goal in of itself, became more of a process, more of a method. So what remains now of the green economy and how this is being used um, in the context of the sustainable development goals, which are a much larger process, is that the green economy is an action-oriented approach 
So it's really about developing policies and testing policies and investments to forecast likely outcomes, to make sure that we can improve value for money, so public expenditure and private investments, in moving towards sustainable development. So sustainable development is the ultimate goal. A green economy is not a goal. Again, it cannot be measured properly or not universally. So sustainable development remains the ultimate goal. But green economy is that approach that can be used through a systemic lens, using systems thinking and system dynamics, to do a proper assessment of policies and investments and assess how far they will take us towards reaching sustainable development. So as a result of this transition, meaning green economy being first seen as an objective and then becoming an approach, since Rio Plus 20, uh, the emphasis in the green economy and green growth field has shifted from assessing outcomes to measuring outcomes. So there was a strong recognition that we had to start measuring progress because by 2012, and especially today, we have several examples of investments in green economy interventions that can be measured. And so we need evidence to support policymaking going forward. So a lot of work has been done in developing green economy indicators at different levels. Uh, these are normally proposed to support each step of the policymaking process, uh, meaning that we want to look at the first step, which is agenda setting. So we want to make sure we have indicators that help us address the problems and identify opportunities. Then the second step of the policymaking process is to do policy formulation. So we need indicators that are focused on identifying targets and that help us assessing what is feasible at the national level and for certain industries. Then we move to the third step, which is policy assessment. So we move from formulation, where we define targets, to assessment, which means that before the implementation, we start, we start forecasting what the outcomes may be. And one clear innovation of the green economy approach is that before implementation, so when we do assessment, ex ante, we need to start looking at social, economic and environmental outcomes within and across sectors. So it is not sufficient to simply look at one sectoral performance because we know already now very well that one sectoral investment may have positive impacts on the sector, but also positive, so synergies, or negative, so side effects, impacts on many other sectors. Then we have the phases of decision making, implementation, where these are very practical actions where a green economy approach through the user indicators cannot help directly or in, in a small, to a small extent. And then we have the final step of the decision-making cycle, which is policy monitoring and evaluation after implementation. So this is once again where we can use green economy indicators and where we can combine all the indicators we have identified before. So we look at indicators of the problem to see whether we have fixed the issue. Then we look at indicators for policy formulation to see whether effectively the policies implemented reflected the potential that we identified. And then we use the same indicators for policy assessment because we want to see, in fact, what are the outcomes of our investments across social, economic and environmental indicators within and across sectors. So when we talk about indicators, we start working with measurements. So we want to assess past performance, but then we also want to get some more or improved understanding of what future trends may look like. So when we started working with green economy indicators, it emerged that there were some aspects of how the economy works that were left behind or they were not emphasized enough. So the green economy normally is being perceived as an economy that focuses on the environment. And, and clearly one aspect that was um, given little consideration when we think about models of development and theories that support us in understanding how the economy evolves was the environment. So we normally used approaches where we consider capital, labor, and technology to represent productivity as the main factors. But we see more and more, especially through the use of indicators, for instance, for ecosystem services and the data that are becoming available uh, in spatially explicit forms, is that there is a strong impact of environmental performance, so ecosystem services and ecological scarcities, in determining the cost of production for industries, but also in determining the cost for providing services or for replacing ecosystem services that are required by the population with grain infrastructure, so with capital investments from the government. So this practically means that if we cut a forest and the forest provided several ecosystem services, such as, for instance, purifying water, so natural filtration for water purification, governments now may need to put in place water treatment facilities 
to make sure that pollution is removed from water and water is treated properly and so it becomes portable for the local population. Another type of ecosystem service provided by forests would be the fact that they absorb water, they slow down water speed when there is heavy rain. So if we cut down the forest, there is more soil erosion, water travels faster, um, especially downhill towards villages that would normally be around rivers or, or similar areas where agricultural production can happen. And this may lead to flash floods. Now, if this happens, if there are flash floods, if there are impacts such as soil erosion, especially in agricultural production, we will have negative consequences for population. And so governments will tend to invest more to make so that the population is protected. And so this means better managing riverbeds and so on and so forth to avoid excessive siltation and sedimentation and then the emergence of these events like flash floods. So overall, what we notice is that in the process of analyzing how an economy works, there are strong differences between what we notice and what we've been working with at the macro level and what actually happens at the micro level, so at that sub-national level. And this is one of the key contributions of the green economy that therefore needs to be applied from local at the landscape level up to macro and national level and beyond when it comes to international trade with, for instance, carbon trading type of interventions to make sure that we understand how the system may evolve and what dynamics are underlying the systems going forward when new investments are implemented. So summarizing what we've discussed up to now is that the concept of green economy has emerged in recent years to respond to the emergence of simultaneous crisis. So it is a response to the systemic nature or the systemic nature of this crisis that we have experienced. There are different organizations working in the field. They use slightly different definitions, but they all have the same common elements, which are the need for economic growth and then the need to reduce the impacts of climate change. So reducing greenhouse gas emissions is one option through climate mitigation but then also the need to improve resource efficiency and to avoid having a negative impact on the environment. So on ecosystem services to avoid also ecological scarcities. This is important because the economy has been driven by different types of capital. We normally tend to focus on manufactured capital, on social capital, as well as human capital, the knowledge we have, but we also have natural capital, which plays an important role. And the main entry point for the green economy is to leverage investments, so the financial capital, to make so that there is a real location of budget to those interventions that, again, help reduce emissions, improve resource efficiency, and support maintaining environmental integrity and quality. At this next session of the video, uh, a focus is on two main aspects. One is the policies or the interventions that can be implemented to support a green economy and then how to assess them. So what methodologies, methods, tools, simulation models are available to assess the performance of these interventions. Concerning the strategies, uh, we will look at different sectors and we'll go through a list of these options briefly and then there will be specific examples provided to show how measurements can be performed. So when it comes to agriculture, for instance, some of the main priorities are to improve the efficiency of water resource use. So in this case, we talk about irrigation to make so that on the one hand, we improve the use of irrigation to increase yields, but also we expand the amount of land that can be irrigated. So if you have 100 liters of water and we use a smaller amount of water per hectare, uh, we can do more hectares of agricultural land with the same amount of water. That is one of the key approaches. The second one is to use sustainable agricultural practices. So this is to make so that we reduce the amount of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, which by the way reduce water pollution uh, for, uh, for instance, rivers where we could have algal blooms, where we could have fish death and health issues, human health issues. But at the same time, with the use of sustainable inputs to agriculture, such, such as organic, organic fertilizers, um, we have several studies that show that there is the potential to increase yields and so to increase productivity and production. In addition to that, um, another trend that we can observe is that there is a premium price being paid for agricultural products that are certified uh, being sustainable, organic or ecological. So again, we take a, a systems approach in determining what type of actions are available but even more so in determining what are the synergies that can be explored in terms of the outcomes across economic sectors, actors, as well as over time. 
The agricultural sector is very much connected to water, as we discussed now. Uh, but water is not only consumed for irrigation. So in the water sector, we have a similar approach where we focus on water efficiency, also for sanitation, for residential use, but we couple it with an approach that focuses on maintaining ecosystem services, which means that it is very important to make sure that we not only consume water effectively, but we do not limit water supply going forward. This is specifically the case of the drought prone areas where, for instance, such as in the case of South Africa, we have invasive species of plants that consume a lot more water than the local species of plants. And this makes so that when there is rainfall, a lot of this water is taken up by plants instead of reaching population or reservoirs. The same can be seen in Mauritius, for instance, where reservoirs have been struggling to being replenished every year. And this is also because of deforestation, the larger or the faster speed of water uh, flowing from the mountains and the fact that it cannot be absorbed and accumulated as well as it did in the past. So again, in the case of water, we have two approaches. On the consumption side, we want to reduce the amount of water that is consumed through efficiency improvements. As well, on the supply side, we want to make sure that we manage well the watershed or the environment more in general to make so that water supply does not decline going forward, but actually it might increase. Connected to water, as discussed now, are forests. And so, the main strategy for forest is to avoid deforestation. This is, of course, connected to the Millennium Development Goals. And in this case, we're looking at both conservation, so making sure that there are more areas that are protected and where, for instance, biodiversity is higher or priority areas for biodiversity are, are more protected and conserved. But also we're looking at avoiding fragmentation of forests. And this is because many of the ecosystem services are provided based on the integrity of ecosystems. And if you have fragmentation, that integrity declines. So it's not only about the size of forests, it's also about the quality of forests. The next sector that we can consider is fisheries. Now this is based on the availability of natural resources, but such as in the case of water, we have two different types of approaches. So the first one is on the actions we implement, so fish catch. One option that we consider here is the use of more sustainable fishing practices, meaning that we avoid using certain types of net that lead to very high bycatch uh, results, meaning that if we want to catch one tuna, we ended up, or we could end up catching five kilos of additional fish, which is not exactly what we need. So one goal is to reduce the impact that unsustainable fishing practices have. Of course, one of the extreme ones being dynamite, for instance, and explosions and so on and so forth. But overall, we want to make the process of fish catch more effective to only get what we actually need. The second aspect is, again, nature-based. So this implies, for instance, making sure that fish reproduction can take place. And so maintaining coral reefs, for instance, and mangroves will make so that there is a safe place for reproduction that ultimately will lead to a larger stock and a, an improved a fish catch process. Meaning that if you have more fish stock, then we can more effectively catch what we need. And again, being the effort reduced, we will have a reduced damage on the environment overall. We have several cases in which these type of interventions have proved very successful. Uh, one case is Rodrigues uh, off the coast of Mauritius on the eastern side, where octopus catch in the lagoon has quadrupled after only closing for two months uh, the catch to allow for reproduction. So we have a mounting, mounting evidence of uh, positive impacts from better managing natural resources to make so that the catch can improve and be more sustainable. The next sector is energy. This is one of the most straightforward, where we have, again, emphasis on efficiency at different levels. So we're looking at residential, commercial, industrial, transport sectors, different types of energy sources. But improving efficiency is clearly a goal for all the sectors. A secondary goal, not less important, but resulting from the potential to improve efficiency is fuel switching, meaning that we can switch to fuels that are less carbon intensive, or use more modern forms of energy as we aim at increasing access to energy and reducing emissions at the same time. And I said that fuel switching is connected to energy efficiency because some of the technologies we can use to improve efficiency also require different fuels. So this is what we see in industrial sectors, for instance in Cambodia, where there is an opportunity, actually out of one investment we have a double opportunity, that is reducing consumption and switching to more sustainable fuels or energy sources. Then, of course, in the energy sector, we have the energy supply side, not only the demand side. 
And this is where the use of renewable energy or lower carbon energy sources uh, become a primary option for intervention. So we're talking about solar power, offshore and offshore wind farms, and so on and so forth. Of course, to be considered is the discussion around hydropower and the fact that being low carbon or zero carbon in terms of use and generation for electricity, it does generate impacts on the environment, uh, especially depending on the type of dam and the extent to which it alters the flow of water in rivers. Next, we have the manufacturing sector, which summarizes a bit of what we discussed up to now, because this is about making production processes more efficient and hence improving profitability for the private sector. So that is the main goal in this area. And improving profitability comes from reducing production costs. So we're talking about reducing energy consumption through energy efficiency, or improving water efficiency for reducing water costs, or improving labor productivity through knowledge and creating these new skills that are related to the new green jobs being created. So overall, we are looking at reducing the cost of production as a primary strategy. A second strategy that we look at in this sector is to reduce the impacts of production. Uh, and that is because if we generate waste and we pollute water, even if companies or the manufacturing sector is not responsible for fixing this problem and treating water and reducing waste, the government will need to pay for it or households will need to pay for it. So we see reductions, for instance, in labor productivity due to health impacts. And this is an impact that is going to be borne by the economy or society at large. So this second option is to make sure that we minimize impacts of production in terms of air and water pollution or any consequences that we may have on the environment and on human health. Connected to manufacturing is of course waste, where we use the 3R approach with reduce, reuse and recycle materials. As you can imagine, this is getting very close to the circular economy concept and where a lot of innovation is taking place. So once again, the green economy is a broader concept that actually brings together more detailed areas of interventions, like circular economy in this case, like the blue economy, as we mentioned, for fishery, for instance. And in this specific case, we are looking at, for waste, reducing the cost of managing waste, because the largest share of the cost is in the collection of waste and the, in the transfer or transport of waste to sorting facilities and incineration facilities. But then at the same time is the recycling and reuse to make so that we reduce the extent to which we need virgin materials for production, which are often more expensive, and at the same time, they generate more impacts on the environment, such as through mining, for instance. Then the next sector is buildings. And once again, this is one of those areas that links together several of the aspects that we mentioned before. Now, in buildings, we have different strategies that, as you can imagine, are similar to manufacturing. So we want to reduce the cost of running a building and using a building. So we have energy efficiency, water efficiency, uh, we also focus on water collection, for instance, rainwater harvesting, the use of green roofs for reducing emissions, but also to filter and obtain more water or naturally filter water. And buildings focus on both, or the analysis for building focuses on both new construction as well as retrofitting buildings. Uh, so in developing countries, there is a lot more emphasis on the new aspects with new building codes, for instance, being introduced in several uh, Southeast Asian countries. But also in developed countries, in Europe, the United States, for instance, a lot of emphasis is put on measuring the performance of existing buildings to make sure that retrofits can help us improve the current stock. And this is an area where the building stock is not growing excessively, population growth is limited. We have a history, so we have several buildings in cities, especially old cities that are really hard to modernize. And so this is where most of the emphasis has been put in developing countries. So the retrofitting of buildings in addition to the creation of new sustainable buildings going forward. A final sector that we consider is tourism. Uh, tourism is a sector that relies on several different types of infrastructure, meaning that it relies on roads, for instance, and access to a specific site or connections via airports, for instance, or rail. Then it uses buildings, as we discussed before. It requires food which could be locally produced. And so the agriculture sector and organic or sustainable ecological production practices could be used in this case. But then also it is connected, especially in the context of ecotourism, to the quality of the environment. Now, if you think of tourism in coastal areas and coral reefs, for instance, and so on and so forth, it is crucial that the quality of the environment is high to make so that a fair amount could be charged every night uh, per tourist visiting. What we notice is that if the quality of the environment declines, the price that can be charged declines, and so the profitability of tourism activities in coastal areas 
uh, worsens. Uh, the same can be seen for the cost of running this infrastructure. Ecotourism is entirely based around the sustainability concept and therefore um, a green tourism sector can only emerge if many of the other sectors we discussed before are also green and sustainable. So in a way, we can see that if there are investments in the green economy in several of these sectors, tourism is an added bonus that can be realized if good performance is achieved overall. Then a very final consideration goes to cities. Uh, the discussion so far has been mostly about national performance or manufacturing levels or industrial performance, but of course cities are also very important. Now, everything we set up to now applies to cities as well. Uh, they need to take care of uh, food production and you know, supply to citizens. They have roads, they have buildings, they have energy needs, they have water consumption and have to manage storm water, for instance, uh, when it comes to large rainfall events. At the same time, they need to ensure that there is mobility uh, for economic productivity and so making the city attractive, which also relies on having green spaces, so the quality of the environment. So overall, we see cities as being treated more or less in the same way as you would treat the planet or a country or a sub-region of the country. All the sectors that we mentioned up to now, all the types of infrastructure that we discussed, should also be analyzed in a systemic way for cities. So up to now, we have discussed about what are the main strategies at the sectoral level. But then what are the key policies and investments that can be promoted or that can be implemented to trigger investment? And investment is a, is a critical factor in the context of green economy because the main problem that we have seen up to now is the misallocation of capital. So a lot of investments in the last few decades went into built capital, supporting economic growth. And this has led to the excessive deterioration of the environment, excessive use of natural resources, or an inefficient use of natural resources that ultimately led to deterioration of the environment as well, and problems emerging through, for instance, climate change and human health and settlements. So it is crucial in the context of green economy and green growth to talk about investments because these are the factors that make change happen. In a way, we can buy new LED lights and that is an investment we put in place to make so that we can reduce energy consumption. Or if the economics are not so good, uh, then governments can plan for incentives. Uh, so that is a way of sharing the cost for uh, purchasing capital or infrastructure that can help us improve efficiency, reduce emission, and then reduce the impact on the environment as well. So overall, if you were to summarize what the main options are, we have, we have four, four main options. One is direct investments. We can invest directly into buying capital, purchasing infrastructure, for instance, to sustainable public procurement that the government may implement. The second one is laws and mandates, so new regulation. Um, if there is a mandate at the national level that every new building should use or must use LED lights, uh, that will simply have to happen. Of course, that will be monitoring, evaluation, making sure that this is taking place, but if it's mandated by law, there is an expectation that this actually takes place. Now, what is the difference between these first two options? Is that when there is capital investment, 100% of the cost is for the actor that makes the investment. So often this will be the government, uh, especially for sustainable public procurement and sustainable infrastructure. But if we have a mandate, then 100% of the cost is for households or industries. So this is not funding that comes out of a government budget, but it's funding that comes out of spending of households and the private sector. We do have an option that, again, shares the cost, and that is the case of incentives. So when the government doesn't have the budget to implement investments on its own, and when the cost is too high, so the project is not bankable or, or there is no economic um, incentive to buy something on our own, meaning buying a LED light may be too expensive for many, so they will not do it. They prefer to buy a conventional light and pay more every month. Um, then incentives can be implemented to share the costs. Uh, so this is, for instance, the case of incentives for energy efficiency in buildings, where the Italian government, to provide an example, has provided up to 55% of the total cost of investment as an incentive that is given back as a tax break over the 10 years following the investment. So this basically means that if I need to spend 10,000 euros to improve energy efficiency in a building, I will invest 10,000 euros in the first place, but then over the years, I will receive money back in a way that I will not pay, or I will pay less taxes than I should have paid um, had I not made that initial investment. Now, this incentive, again, makes so that there is a cost-sharing mechanism, but at the same time, it doesn't guarantee that a specific target is reached. 
It depends on how attractive this incentive is. It depends on how many people buy into the incentive. So they consider it valuable and actually have the funding to invest. So here we see another difference. With capital investments, we know exactly as a government what we're buying and what the impacts will be. With a mandate, we can expect with some degree of certainty that everyone will follow or the vast majority of the population will follow the new law or regulation. And so we know exactly what is the target we can achieve. With incentives, there is a lot of uncertainty. So we know what is the amount of money as a government that we can spend to provide this incentive, but we don't know what the outcome is. And so this moves to the fourth item. The fourth item or the third type of intervention option is uh, improving social awareness. So implementing interventions, so public outreach and so on and so forth, that make people aware of the opportunity of investing in green economy interventions. And I said that this is connected to the incentives because if we simply implement an incentive and there is no knowledge of the opportunity, then there will be little buy-in from households or the private sector. So it is very important to focus also on this awareness raising, uh, raising type of activities to make sure so there is knowledge, awareness of the opportunities, and if the economics are good enough for different segments of the population and economic sectors, then investments will be implemented. So again, to summarize, there are four main types of interventions. Capital investment, so direct investment, mandates, regulations and laws, incentives to share the cost, and then awareness raising or public awareness capacity building exercises at the social level. So up to now, we have talked about the green economy definition, where it comes from and what it means. Then we talked about what are the main strategies at the sectoral level to implement green economy interventions and reach sustainable development goals. Now, once we have the strategies in mind and once we know what the policy options are, and we talked about these four main items for policy interventions, so capital investment, mandates and laws, incentives and social awareness activities, how can we measure how can we forecast and measure the likely outcomes of policy interventions? So normally what we rely on is simulation models or forecasting exercises of various types. So first of all, we should say that simulation models are a simplification of reality, uh, meaning that models can never be as complex as reality actually is. And in terms of complexity, we have two main definitions that we should use. Uh, we normally work with detailed complexity and dynamic complexity. Now, detailed complexity has to do with, for instance, uh, the steps of a production process. Let's say that we need 1,000 different steps to produce a vehicle, to produce a car or a mobile phone. This is pretty much the assembly process, where we have one action happening after the other in some sort of a linear fashion, where even if we have thousands of steps, hundreds of thousands of steps, we can always figure out where something went wrong and how to fix it, because there are several steps in sequence. In the second case, for dynamic complexity, which is really what we should focus on for the green economy, because it's more systemic in nature, we are talking about the degree of interconnections within the elements of a system. So here we are looking at whether we have feedback loops in the system, so circular relations that change performance, and whether we have impacts that are emergent over time. So whether we have more dynamic relations that make so that everything may seem fine in the short and medium term, but then something emerges in the medium and longer term that takes us away from these linear relationships or linear trends that we might otherwise observe with more traditional models. So again, dynamic complexity has to do with the degree of interconnection of the parts in the system and whether there are feedback loops, non-linear effects that emerge over time. Why are we mentioning this is because there are different types of models and methodologies that can be used to assess green economy performance. And some of these are linear and some of these are instead more dynamic, non-linear um, in nature. So overall what we have seen is that we have always had a wealth of models that we could use to forecast policy impacts. And as you can imagine, some of the green economy interventions are not new. Uh, we have known for decades uh, that it's important to improve energy efficiency and water efficiency. And we have had models for a long period of time that would help us understanding what is the cost of improving energy efficiency or what is the impact of improving energy efficiency on production cost, emissions, employment, and so on and so forth. So we can distinguish between two main groups of models when we talk about green economy. Those models that are applied at the sectoral level and those models that are applied at the cross-sectoral level 
uh, whether that is national level or international level for trade agreements and so on and so forth, we do have these two main groups of models. The first group at the sectoral level is the one that has been used up to now very, very often, uh, both at the national level and at the sectoral level by sectors, industries and companies. The second one is a more emerging type of models that is developing and has been introduced to a certain extent with the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, and even more strongly than with green economy and green growth. Concerning the first group of models, sectoral models, uh, we have several for each of the sectors that we mentioned before. Uh, so one of the most straightforward examples is the case of energy. In the energy sector, we had for many years uh, models that are called systems engineering models, uh, meaning that they help us assess what is the best investment or where we should invest to minimize the cost of energy supply. Now, this is a model that optimizes performance. It's basically telling us, given certain conditions, expectations on energy prices, expectation on demand, expectation on the cost of capital for different technologies, or expectations on the reduction of the cost of different technologies, take for instance solar power and the fact that it's becoming cheaper and cheaper, the model will tell us where we should invest and how much we should invest to minimize the cost of supply. Uh, very practically speaking, if we expect electricity demand to increase going forward and we need to expand capacity, the model will take into account all the available technologies. Uh, it could be thermal with coal and gas, for instance. It could be biomass or cogeneration, solar, wind, and so on and so forth. And based on the cost of technology, the load factor or the efficiency of use, so how much this technology can be used during the day, and when demand is, whether we have demand in the morning, afternoon, or night, it will basically do an assessment of what is the total cost of the energy sector or electricity generation and will point us to the lowest possible cost or to the investment that leads to the lowest possible cost. Now, this is an approach that works very well for planners within the energy sector, but there will be consequences of these investments in other sectors as well. Uh, for instance, if you're able to minimize the cost of electricity and that cost will be lower than what we have right now, we can expect an increase in economic activity. So if GDP grows more than expected or more than initially forecasted, then electricity demand might also increase. And so that creates a feedback loop that requires that maybe we need to invest more or expand the capacity for the electricity sector. At the same time, there may be technologies that minimize costs, such as, for instance, coal and gas, that generate more emissions or are more carbon intensive than other technologies. And in certain areas, generating more air emissions or CO2 emissions, um, increasing the concentration in the atmosphere, may lead to health impacts for the population. And so it may well be that the cost of health impacts is larger than the avoided cost or the cost reduction from investing in coal and gas rather than investing in renewable energy. So there are several considerations that with the green economy concepts are being made in the context of green economy, green growth, and so on and so forth are being made and should be accounted for in the use of models for generating these projections. So what we are leaning towards is basically an assessment that doesn't necessarily optimize because it's very difficult, if not impossible, to optimize for sustainable development because we all have different ideas on what should be prioritized. For instance, do we go for an investment that costs $100 but generates 50 jobs? Or do we go for one investment that costs $200 but generates 75 jobs? So the decision in that case really depends on whether we have the funding, the cost of financing, if we don't have the funding, and how many jobs we need to create, meaning do we have high unemployment in the country or not. So if we try and use an optimization model to figure out what we should do for sustainable development, the risk is that we end up with endless discussions about whether we should prioritize society over the economy or over the environment. And so this is why we're moving towards more systemic approaches that aim at maximizing, not necessarily optimizing, but maximizing a system's performance rather than a sectoral performance. So when it comes to analyzing the performance of a system, we need to define what the system is. So we have many models, like the one for energy, that are called systems engineering models because they look at the energy system. Or we have macroeconomic models that look at the system in terms of the country or the whole economy of the country that are called computable general equilibrium models, CGE models. Now, these models, these last example CGEs, are in general more systemic in nature because they look at economic performance across sectors and they look at economic actors as well, such as households, companies, the private sector, and so on and so forth. 
uh, at different levels as well as governments. Uh, but nevertheless, most of these models, or the most traditional applications of CGE models, entirely focus on economic flows. So they, they don't explicitly take into account the social and the environmental dimensions of development. Now, this is not to say that these models are not good or good enough for carrying out a green economy analysis. It's just to say that every model is built for a purpose, and the purpose of these models the CG models is to support budgetary planning and better assess performance of government accounts and households accounts. So it's a purely economic assessment that is 100% tailored around specific needs of a certain set of stakeholders and audience. The same is true for the energy models or for land use models or for ecosystem assessment models, uh, where these tools have been created to respond to a specific question. So what we notice is that we have best-in-class models in doing sectoral analysis that can provide very useful inputs for a green economy assessment, but somehow they miss some dimensions that are crucial when a true systemic analysis has to be carried out that looks at social, economic and environmental factors, that looks at one sector as well as the impacts across sectors, that looks at changes over time, so through a simulation rather than optimization, and also considers impacts in space so in a specific location, such as in the case of land use models. Overall, in the modeling field for green economy and green growth, we have seen two trends. The first one is that existing models, like the sectoral ones or CG for macroeconomic performance, have been used, and they have been enhanced, so they've been improved, expanded, to capture more of the indicators that are relevant for green economy assessments. So some extensions of these models include a more explicit assessment of employment creation, some others include assessing, for instance, water pollution or assessing impacts on emissions. But again, there are certain features that are missing, some of those more systemic features, such as, for instance, the use of feedback loops and nonlinear dynamics. So the second trend that we have seen is the emergence of new models that are created to carry out explicitly a green economy assessment, so a more systemic assessment of the performance of an infrastructure, a sector or a country. Now, as I said before, every model is built for a purpose. So the more the model is systemic, meaning that it's horizontally integrated or more transversal, so it covers several sectors with a little bit of detail, um, it leads to consideration as to when we should use them and how. Conventional models are normally vertically integrated, so they have a lot of detail, several variables to measure performance of the sectors, but no cross-sector representation. So normally what we see is that systems models, so this new generation of models, is being used to carry out assessments of policy formulation. So if we want to get an idea of what are the main issues, what are the main opportunities, and what are the achievable targets, avoiding side effects or unexpected impacts, these models are very good because they track performance across all the key sectors of relevance. When a specific target needs to be identified, when specific implementation options need to be assessed, then it's good to use the more sectoral, the more detailed at the sectoral level, models that are already available. So overall, the new systems models are not replacing what was done before, or what has been done up to now, they're just complementing that type of assessment to have a more systemic view on the performance of the system. What happens then is that at the end of the decision-making cycle, when monitoring and evaluation takes place, this is when it is useful to consider again both models, because first we need to assess whether there is good performance within the sector we're interested in, say energy for instance, whether the investment turned out to be the same as we expected, but then also we need to use system models to capture whether in reality we are performing across sectors and across social, economic and environmental dimensions as we expected. If there are side effects emerging, the use of these systems models can help us identify what are complementary intervention options to fix the problems and support sustainable development going forward. So now, without indicating what are the best models to look at green economy interventions, because there is no absolute best overall, uh, I would like to mention that there is a, a common thread that we have discussed from the very beginning. If the definition of the green economy needs to be customized at the local level, that means that also models to assess performance have to be customized at the local level. Uh, this is because they need to capture the social, economic and environmental context, as well as some of the cultural aspects through the definition of scenarios that we will find at the local level. So this means that we need to have a model, and this new generation of models is addressing that need, that takes into account stocks and flows. So it looks at factors of change, 
flows, for instance, but also the state of the system, which is represented by stocks. This allows us to better understand what are the drivers of change and how they're shaping the system over time. Uh, this is because we're normally aiming at optimizing or finding the optimal level for flows. So the annual performance should be optimized instead of looking at the historical trends for the system. Uh, for instance, we always want to maximize fish catch, but it's very, very difficult to take into account what is the performance of the stock of fish. So if we keep expanding the amount of vessels and boats and provide support to fishermen to go out fishing, all they will do is further deplete the stock of fish and that will ultimately lead to a collapse of the system. If we instead focus on the stock and try and replenish it without even investing in new boats and vessels and supporting fishermen, their fish catch will increase. But at that point, we will not see collapse. We see a more stable development for the sector. So this is a key feature of these new models that need to be assessed. And this is how we customize them to the local level. We need to have stocks and flows being explicitly captured to be able to assess why trends are taking shape and whether these are sustainable. So looking at the snapshot in time, it's not sufficient. We need to look at trends over time and explain them very clearly to figure out what is the causality that leads to the emergence, the emergence of certain trends. A second key feature is that these models have to be personalized or customized to national priorities. Uh, in other words, as we said earlier, investments are critical for driving a green economy transition or to driving progress towards sustainable development. So we need to make sure that these models are not only valid from a technical point of view, representing a lot of detail for technologies and information options, but they also have to be useful for supporting policy formulation and policy assessment. So this means that they have to be able to capture investments that are direct through incentives to new laws and regulations and awareness raising activities. And as a result, they have to be able to capture the potential emergence of side effects. So they have to be customized at the local level to make sure that it will be possible to identify whether some of these policy interventions will backfire or would result to be less effective than we initially thought. And this is crucial because ultimately we want to use these models to support a discussion or to inform a discussion, uh, models being one of the many inputs that decision makers would use to make their decisions, as to what type of strategies, policies and investments should be put in place. So one additional comment about the support to the policy process is that in my experience, what I've seen uh, over the years in the context of green economy strategies and, uh, and policies, and I've worked with about 40 countries in the last 10 years or so on these topics, is that the highest probability of success for effectively informing a decision-making process on green economy is when there is no green economy strategy being developed. In other words, when governments develop or companies develop a strategy for green economy, they are creating a separate track. So they're creating a parallel policy process that is somewhat competing with the ongoing exercises that are being done at the sectoral level for the short term, for instance, budgetary processes or medium term development plans and so on and so forth. So what we see is the emergence of a disconnect between this new paradigm that they see as green economy and what they were doing already. Instead, what I see being most effective, and this is emerging more and more in later years when there is more awareness of what the green economy concept is, is when green economy principles are embedded in ongoing policy exercises. So when planning for the energy sectors take into account both efficiency and renewable energy, so the demand and the supply side, and how this sector is actually affecting other sectors. So what is the impact of having higher or lower energy prices on economic production and how that affects energy demand and how that affects emissions, for instance, and the cost of health for the government. So this is where I see more progress being made in truly transitioning to a more systemic policy formulation and policy evaluation exercise.